evening to everyone attending. If you are in London or in Europe, good morning or good afternoon, because I think there are many people all over the world with more than 1,500 uh, people registering for this webinar. So thank you very much for your interest in the fit of heart and for joining uh, this seminar. Uh, without much ado, I'd like to introduce Monique Haag, which I think many of you will know, so she needs very little introduction, but I'll just few, say a few words about Monique. She is the head of the prenatal diagnosis in Leiden uh, Medical Center. She is a consultant in fetal medicine and fetal surgeon, which is quite unique. The specific interest in the fetal heart as seen from her many publications from screening to diagnosis and long-term outcome. She has a great interest in a very uh, promising area, an interesting area of neurodevelopment of congenital heart disease cases, pathogenesis, genetics, uh, screening results, and particularly missed defects, which I think are very important. It's gonna be part of her focus today on her presentation. Uh, she's got other interests, specific interests in genetics, education, and recently has received a very large government grant to evaluate the benefits of introducing early screening program in the Netherlands, which is to start off next year. Uh, Monique is going to start with tips and traps, part one, uh, and I hand over to her and I'm sure you enjoy her presentation. Monique. Evening or maybe good morning, everybody. Um, it's really an honor to speak for such a big audience because rooms are normally a little bit smaller. And I really want to thank Canon for organizing this uh, event. I will uh, kick off with the first talk with some tips and tricks for daily uh, fetal cardiac exam. And the organizing committee asked me to specifically focus on screening and with that um, also on uh, missed uh, defects. Uh, I assume that you all know the ISWOC uh, guideline um, and it's and I think this guideline is really important and um, for those who don't know the guideline it's free on the internet and I really encourage you to read this one. Here you see the five basic planes that we use to examine the fetal heart in a screening setting. These planes are three of them are more or less perpendicular to each other except for the red one, the left ventricular outflow tract. That plane needs tilting and rotating of your probe. So that one is, I think, a little bit more difficult. If you see the, uh, the pictures that I made of these uh, planes on the bottom of my slide, you can see that these differ a tiny bit from those pictures of the ISO guidelines. The reason why I did this, I will explain to you in this presentation. First, I want to draw your attention to the effect of the three-vessel view. We introduced the three-vessel view as a man mandatory plane in our screening program in 2012, and you see the increase of detection rates. Nowadays, in our country, uh, transposition and fallow is detected in around 80% of cases. 80% is good. But that still means that 20% is not recognized. After that, we introduced the three vessel view in our country. It puzzled me why this 20% is still remains undetected. Despite all the courses that I do and all the teaching that we do with each other, with clips, as you see here, of transposition cases uh, with very nice examples. So that's why I initiated this study. Um, what we did is that we, that we retrieved the original uh, images of the screen, uh, from the screening facilities. We focused on isolated congenital heart defects. That's important. That means that those fetuses did not have any other defects. We retrieved uh, all cases from our pre register uh, registry and we compared unselected 57 detected cases versus 58 undetected cases. And all these images were scored by two blinded fetal echo experts. What did we see? We saw that in 30% of the undetected cases, the defect was clearly visible. 
I think that can be solved by more education. In 20%, the images were perfectly normal. That were mainly coarct cases and ventricular septal defects. And in half the cases, the planes were technically inadequate. Sometimes we could see that things were wrong, but we could not make the diagnosis. In detected cases, however, the technical quality of the planes was much better. So you could easily think, hmm, maybe these were bad sonographers. But that was not the case. In the biannual um, uh, quality assessment, what we do in our country, these uh, um, sonographers had similar scores to other sonographers. So in normal situations, they performed really well. So I hypothesized that these people have either a difficulty, difficulty uh, with their motor skills to adapt to the altered anatomy, or that they have a less developed sense of doubt. Are there other risk factors? The answer to that, to be short, is no. Especially fetal position, which is often mentioned as a reason uh, to, to uh, maintain undetected, was not different from uh, the cases that, uh, that were detected. What lessons can we learn from studying all these missed defects? And I will focus in the following slides on transposition and follow. The first message that I want to give you is that what I frequently encountered in this missed case, and that are more psychology factors, is that people save numerous pictures of abnormal planes and then they stop their examination at the end with one or two more or less normal, uh, normal planes. So I think and I hypothesis that people are at that stage re that they were in doubt, but that they are reassured by a a falsely reassured by a normal plane. Let's show some examples. This is a transposition which is missed. Here you see an attempt to make the three vessel view. Here another attempt of a three vessel view, which was confirmed by color Doppler. When I looked at this kind of cases, I was questioning myself, how did we teach people in the past to recognize a transposition? And I think these are the things that we teach people. Parallel course, an absence of crossing, and an abnormal three vessel view. Why are sonographers thinking that this is a normal three vessel view? If I um, compared that to the cartoon of the Israel guidelines, and if you compare these two, then you suddenly see that these pictures are not that different. And as an expert, you see that there are differences, but I can really understand that this is misinterpreted as a three vessel view. How can we avoid this? This is a 16 week, so very tiny fetus with transposition. And look at the bottom. I hope that you see my pointer. Uh, the Israel guideline picture. My first tip not to miss transposition is to really follow the left ventricular outflow tract until this part, until it really leaves the heart at the atrial level, because that is the part where branching occurs um, uh, when uh, not the aorta is arising from the left ventricle, but the pulmonary artery. Then the second tip, don't be falsely reassured by crossing. This is the same transposition baby of 16 weeks. Here you see a vessel from the left artery, uh, sorry, left ventricle, the yellow bar. And here you see a vessel coming from the right ventricle. And you could be reassur reassured by some kind of crossing. The trivessel view looks like this. And how people produce with those three black circles in the chest a more or less three vessel view, I do not really understand, but I think that they have a plane lower and it is a part of the, of the left atrium that produces a circle in the chest. But this is 
the three vessel view, the two vessel view of a transposition. So this is important to really make a good three vessel view. A last remark concerning parallel uh, cores that is not seen in the transverse plane. That is seen in an oblique long, longitudinal plane. So that is really difficult to get. So don't look for that. So don't look for crossing. Don't look for parallel vessels. To diagnose a transposition, you should focus on a proper three vessel view. What is a proper three vessel view? A proper three vessel view is this. And that is what I meant with slightly different from the issue of guideline. You, could, you can add some marks, some hallmarks in that three vessel view. The first hallmark is the size of the pulmonary artery and the, and the artery. They are more or less the same with the pulmonary artery being slightly bigger. Secondly, you should uh, visualize the pulmonary valve in the three vessel view because then you know that the pulmonary artery is arising from this upper part of the right ventricle. And finally, spatial relationship. What is helpful uh, in that is to draw imaginary a line from the pulmonary valve to the superior caval vein. The aorta should be parallel in that line. They should be next to each other and not behind each other. Compare that to the three vessel views of, um, of the missed cases. If you use that tips, then you are triggered that the three vessel view is not normal. So a three vessel view is not three black circles in the chest, but you should examine more. You should not be satisfied with only three uh, black circles. Then fellow, um, this is a case of, missed, uh, of a missed fellow. I think with the uh, upper, uh, with the lower uh, left, in this picture, maybe there is some doubt about uh, the aorta, but I really think that the sonographer is falsely reassured by the color Doppler that, the, that uh, the attachment of the aorta to the ventricular septum is intact. And again, a three vessel view, which only has three black circles. How has Fallot been taught in the past? And I cannot read it because um, uh, Julien is in front of this black uh, box. But I think there's, there is uh, uh, being said normal um, uh, for chamber view, overriding of the aorta and a small pulmonary artery. Now let's see a follow cases. Case. This is 20 weeks for chamber view, perfectly normal. That reassures you. Follows have normal four chamber views. Then we go uh, to um, the outflow tracks, and I will pause this one to really show you what uh, overriding of the aorta is. Here you see already the bright spots here and here of the ventricular septum defect, but the overriding is not so easy to depict. It's here. These are the walls of the aorta. This is the top of the ventricular septum and the aorta is more than 50% above the right ventricle. To see that, you have to depict the right ventricle as well. And then the tracks, the pitfalls, this is the same baby. And it is quite easy. It is quite easy to be reassured by this picture. Here it looks like it is continuous, but it isn't. So if you saw that previous picture, keep your doubt and don't let, be, let you be falsely reassured by this kind of pictures because the right ventricle is not in the image. I will finish up with the three vessel view. Again, the same tips of the three vessel view. And if you look here, then you see the, that the aorta is really a lot bigger than the pulmonary artery. And again, a big trigger, the caval vein is behind the aorta and not next to the aorta. 
So the psychology of screening, if I see uh, those missed cases, I have some, some advices. And I think I see a lot of cases where I think the sonographer is in doubt. So listen to the feelings of doubt. And if you are in doubt, look for abnormalities and don't let you be reassured, falsely reassured by normal planes. Don't examine anatomy with the use of color Doppler. Color Doppler is used to examine flow direction uh, and not to examine the anatomy. And if you are in doubt, ask for help or refer. Finally, listen to your hand if, uh, and, and your wrist. If a plane cannot be acquired easily, consider that that is because there is an abnormality. And finally, I think that is also really important. Don't blame the fetus for bad behavior. I have a lot of referrals in which the women are almost crying because they have what they say, a bad behaving fetus. So the, the take home message is know how your normal plane should look like. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think you can hear me now. Yes. Good. Uh, I was uh, trying to track through here um, the chat, but I think people are still feeling very um, kind of, uh, suppressed in asking questions, such an important subject. So I, I'm going to start just making some comments until I see that people, you know, get enthusiastic because we all miss abnormalities and we need to learn from that. And the only way to learn really is to look back at your pictures. You know, if I see a patient with an abnormality or even a normal heart, quite often I look back at the pictures and I always find something that I didn't see when I'm scanning, you know, kind of a live, live uh, session of the scanning. So there's all these nuances in the image. Most important as well, you pointed out, it is quite easy to record a still image, a still frame of an abnormality showing that it is a normal image, like showing normal continuity of the aorta to the septum when you know there is the challenge. I can print those images because the defect is much more anterior. So images can be very uh, deceiving. We can think, we can record something that looks near normal when in reality there isn't. So it's quite tricky. And the heart moves, so it is very important that people follow the structures, as you said, rather than just trying to stick to still image snapshots of the heart uh, and, and look for abnormalities. If you can't find the normal image you're looking for, don't always think that that is because there's a high BMI, there's a, a difficult fetal position, you have to put top of the list, am I not getting the, the real image because there is a problem or is it a technical issue? And if you can't decide, and then you have to discuss with someone else, uh, and that's the way to um, improve your detection rate if you are at the screening level. So I don't know if my colleagues want to make any other comments on this. We have very short time for um, questions, but people are still... Um, just have a I, here. Julie, there are some questions. Yes, um, so just ask to Monique. So maybe Monique, can you explain the Caval valve line move just a little bit more in detail? Sorry, sorry, can you repeat the question? Can you explain the Caval valve line more in detail? Oh, okay. Uh, yes, what what um, if you if you look in that way to the three vessel view, you draw a line from uh, the pulmonary valve to the upper part of the caval vein. And in that line, the aorta should be in between and more or less pressing to that line. And if it is more in front of that line, it is abnormal. So can I, the question I can see here that, uh, is a question related to do, use of Doppler, Monique, if you could uh, answer that. How often do you use Doppler on the fetal heart? Uh -huh. What's this? I, I, I activate Doppler on the heart. Yeah, I, I use Doppler on the fetal heart all the time, of course. Um, uh, but um, I think uh, sometimes people, uh, and, and I really encourage to use color Doppler. The only thing is, 
that you should not use it um, uh, to search for the anatomy. If you have the anatomy depicted on your screen, then you can add on uh, color Doppler to see flow direction or to see um, uh, the velocity of flow. Uh, but sometimes in less experienced sonographers, I see that they use color Doppler uh, to search for uh, certain uh, structures. And I think that is not right. I think if I could just add, because I don't think there's any other questions uh, coming coming up um, as about the Doppler. I think the Doppler is essential to look at the fetal heart, particularly if you are trying to improve your screening, but in very difficult to scan patients, uh, that's, you know, the image resolution is so poor, the color will add to seeing the anatomy, not on its own, because you can feel the ventricle with color flow when there is a lot of noise, either because the spine is up or there's uh, less amniotic fluid or there's a, uh, high BMI, so the color will add in assisting to see the anatomy in the very difficult to scan patients. Uh, but I agree entirely with Monique, now you need really to see the 2D image. Um, so thank you very much, Monique. Very interesting, very important presentation. As I said, a reviewing image is uh, essential. And feedback, whenever people find that there is a baby born with a postnatal diagnosis, if you can trace the person who did the screening and give a feedback and say so they can review their image, that's a wonderful way of learning by experience and also that mistake's not made again. So uh, thank you very much again. We're going to move on to our second presentation. Uh, no need to introduction again. Our second speaker, uh, Professor John Simpson, uh, is Professor of Pediatric and fetal cardiology at Evelina London Children's Hospital in London. He also leads successfully the fetal cardiology and pediatric echo services at Evelina. Um, John is going to follow with tips and traps, part two. Enjoy. Thank you very much indeed, Jelani. Uh, thank you, Moni, for a great talk. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here for this evening. Big thank yous to Canon for organizing this symposium. Um, I'm going to talk, just sort of extend on what Monique's been saying and really give some sort of challenging examples of things which are either topical or more difficult for us to see and talk through those. So the sort of things I'm going to cover are uh, partly to do with the aortic arch, where I'm going to classify this as wrong size and vascular rings, where I'm really looking at wrong place. I'm going to take a very close look at the four chamber view and look at some abnormal connections and some subtle abnormalities. I think it would be a really big mistake of me to try and cover everything in 13 or 14 minutes. So I'm going to try and pick out selected examples and then field, field questions as we go through. You'll be aware if you look at the image on the left is a sort of anatomic image of show, looking at a left side of the aortic arch. But as Monique has already shown, this is, tends to be the sonographic cut we take with the uh, one three vessel trachea view, the SVC here, the, the transverse aortic arch and the left and the left side of duct. And normally the aortic arch is to the left as well as the duct. And if we look at the sonographic equivalence of those, we actually more mainly, I guess, do this by eye, is we're now seeing the right ventricle, pulmonary valve and duct we now see the transverse aortic arch and these vessels come together in the normal V with the trachea here outside of this V formed between those vessels. And just to emphasize what Monique said again, in descending order of size, you can see from the duct, transverse aortic arch to the uh, superior vena cava. And one of the areas which we're particularly concerned with is looking at the distal aortic arch because this is one of the areas which we use to judge coarctation of the aorta. We prefer from a crude screening perspective to use this three vessel trachea view because the aortic and ductal arches are in different planes. And if you were to compare their size, you really need to use a transverse approach rather than the longitudinal or sagittal planes. With respect to coarctation, you may get a clue from the relative size of the ventricles. And here's some examples with right ventricular dominance 
in all of these upper panes. And now if we look at the size of the great arteries, we can see dominance of the ductal arch compared to the transverse aortic arch. But note, there's a very high degree of overlap between true coarctations as proven postnatally and false positive cases, which we're all familiar with. And that is one of our biggest problems is, is trying to work out what is a true positive case and what's a false positive case. And I'm going to give you some tips about this. You may also see where there, you see this discrepancy that very often though there may be bilateral supervenous cavas. So you don't just see one SVC on the right, but another one here over on the left in a couple of these examples. But this is a very important lesion for us to predict clinically as its prenatal diagnosis is associated with improved outcome. Now this is a really, if you look at the top right here, it's a really nice um, uh, uh, image from Andrew Cook where he's looked at casts of the fetal heart. And I want you to look at the normal fetal arches where you see the duct insert really into the side of the aortic arch, whereas in, co in coarctation, the aortic arch is more inserting into the side of the arterial duct. And although some fetal coarctations may be relatively discreet, the rule is more that there is a degree of hypoplasia. And this is the hypoplasia which we appreciate on the three vessel view. So although our screening view may be using three vessel trachea view, there is some benefit to look at these longitudinal views. And we see here very nicely the, transver the transverse aortic arch with the ductal aortic ar ductal arch underneath. And this very narrowed area of the uh, isthmus, the distal aortic arch, inserting more into the side of the, uh, uh, of the ductal arch. And just looking at the grayscale image here, again, you see this really important, if you can see it, in terms of the ductal isthmal junction, you see the size of the duct and the distal arch here. And note with this vertical orientation, this isthmus, the true isthmus, may actually fall out of the plane of the three vessel trachea view. This is what we more do in practice is actually look in with sweep. So we go from the, through here, from the ductal arch through to the aortic arch and note the size discrepancy here. And then we go on to look to get further information looking on color flow at the anatomy of the ductal isthmal junction. So again, I would really encourage you to look, if you do suspect an abnormality, to not simply rest on the three vessel trachea view, but it's very helpful to get additional views. There are an absolute multitude of studies looking at predictors of coarctation, and probably it's the lesion which most fetal cardiologists feel most uncomfortable about. I just point you to some recent data from our group, from Tricia Vigneswaran, which are based on prospective rather than retrospective data on um, well over 100 cases, where we're looking at the, the chances of there being co coarctation being related to both the uh, Z-score of the transverse aortic arch and the arterial duct. So with a bigger arterial duct versus very small transverse aortic arch, you get your highest percentage chance of coarctation of the aorta. But if you look at all these numbers in all the panels here, you'll note that none of these numbers are 100%. So I think in most people's book, this is a, a lesion which remains to be confirmed after birth. Some of the things we're looking at, and I'll show a few more pictures later on, are now with our motion-corrected fetal cardiac MRI, we can get really novel insights into the anatomy of the aortic arch. These are fetal cases. And this is looking from the back, looking at the size of the distal transverse arch and the dust ductal arch. And we're looking at this extensively to see if this can actually give us some uh, better predictors of postnatal coarctation. You note here, the end to side anatomy of the, uh, uh, of the transverse aortic arch. And there's really a multitude of examples here and I'll stop there. Otherwise, we'll just look at coarctations all evening. Now I'm going to move outside where we've looked where the aorta is, if you like, the wrong, the wrong side to look at vessels which are in the wrong place. And these are really being in, in, seen 
far more frequently because of the introduction of the three vessel view, three vessel trachea view. And I'm really only going to cover some of the commoner variants and a very brief discussion of the implications. These are the sort of things that we're looking at. First, we have the normal left arch and left duct, which you'll be familiar with. The next group is the right aortic arch, so passing to the right of the trachea with a left sided arterial duct. Very frequently, there will be an aberrant left subclavian artery. And you can see the net effect is that there is a ring encircling both the esophagus and the trachea. So we're bothered about this because of the potential for the compression of the esophagus or trachea or both. And in this example here, we have a true double aortic arch with the right arch to the right, left arch to the left. Uh, so a true blue textbook double aortic arch with the same effect or similar effect of compression of the esophagus and trachea. In a study we published recently looking at background population, um, these are the sort of incidences we found of isolated right arch and double arch. And of, uh, of note is that with isolated right aortic arch, we find a 5% instance of 22Q. So aside from the, the compressive effects, we're worried about associations. And there's quite a lot of controversy and argument about the moment about the precise degree of that relationship. But certainly in this series, the incidence was around 5%. So let's start by looking at right aortic arch with left arterial duct. So when you look at this, what you're seeing, this is the, a view of the upper mediastinum. You're seeing the SVC. You're now seeing the right aortic arch, a left arterial duct, and the trachea is now between these vessels. So this is the right arch, left duct. And this makes, rather than a V, a U shape of these vessels where those arches meet behind the trachea. And if you look at this with color, here's another ex similar example where we're showing a right arch, a left duct, the trachea is between the two arteries. And posteriorly here, you can see the later rising aberrant left subclavian artery. And this is often best seen early in gestation rather than late in gestation. And you can see their label diagram to the right here. Double aortic arch usually has a dominant right arch. There is, are usually symmetrical head and neck vessels as you move, as you scan upwards. And again, with a similar effect as we've discussed. So here, what we're seeing is a right arch. So you have the SVC, a right arch, a smaller left arch, and a left pulmonary artery and duct. So if you like, you get a sort of um, four vessel view. If you like, there's an SVC and then three arches to see. SVC, right arch, left arch, and left duct. And here is the color representation. And this is one something, if you want a sort of uh, pattern to look at, you see a sort of Z with the pattern that these arteries make, with the right arch, the left arch, and the left duct. And this is a, just a label to, uh, uh, of the same image. Um, we published some work recently, which I'll leave you to, to reference, uh, to look at in terms of uh, how we see these and implications for after birth. But very importantly, is that how these look before birth is not necessarily the way they look after birth. And what we see many times is we have a prenatal, this is again a fetal cardiac MRI, with the right arch, left arch, and left duct. But very often with closure of the duct, this left side of the aortic arch becomes atretic. So it can be falsely diagnosed, or you know, the, 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 the appearances prenatal and postnatal look quite different. And this just shows some of the benefits of using the MRI technique to show the right, the left arch, and this left arch very often inserts in towards the duct rather than very pos posteriorly towards the descending aorta. This is a rare example, but something to watch. So this is the right of the fetus, the left of the fetus. And then this example, there is a right aortic arch as we come up here. And there's also a right-sided 
duct. So this is the right arch and right duct, and you'll see that the trachea is not between these vessels. So in this example, right arch and right duct, there is no vascular ring because the trachea is not encircled by these vessels. I'm going to move across just rapidly across now to look from the outflow tracts towards four chamber pitfalls and just a kind of not quite random but a, a selection of abnormalities here. So this is again um, when Monique was talking about really looking for the first branching artery from the vent from the uh, uh, left ventricle. I really would encourage you to not just look that there are four chambers but to really look hard at what those chambers are. So when you see here, we, this we think will be the left atrium and this is the right atrium, and that would be correct. I've shown the situs shot here. But you notice that this chamber connects to a chamber, to connect this, the atrium connects to a ventricle with a moderator band, with a more apical AV valve, and the more anterior ventricle connected to the right atrium is smooth walled with, a more, with, with a, uh, an AV valve inserted further from the apex. So what we're looking at here is a left atrium to morphologic right ventricle and right atrium to morphologic left, left ventricle. And this is what we call discordant AV connections. In this example, the cardiac axis is normal, but very often in these cases, the axis is abnormal. But the take home point is to look very carefully not just at which side ventricles are on, and not just their size, and look at some aspects of their features. This is important because this, this arrangement in its simplest form leaves the right ventricle pumping blood around the body, and this has an implications for long-term prognosis. We, we published a recent series, large prenatal series on this, and I'll leave you to have a look at that if you wish. The next lesion I'm going to focus on is on atrioventricular septal defect or AV canal defect. And really importantly, this is if I'm looking from the ventricles up towards the atriums, that this is an atrioventricular septal defect is not just a hole between the atriums and the ventricles. The whole anatomy of the AV valves is wrong. So there are leaflets which bridge from the left ventricle across to the right above and below here. So if you look only at the short axis of the left ventricle, you see a, an AV valve which effectively has three leaflets. Now this is easy if we look at a classical a AVSD here with a big ventricular component, no septation of the atrium. But it's really important if you can to get some look at the short axis of the AV valves this is an AVSD where we see a common AV valve with leaflets bridging between the left and right ventricles. And in contrast, you see the normal left AV valve with a bileaflet left AV valve and no leaflets are extending towards the ventricular septum. If we look at this example here, I bet everyone in this audience would say this looks like a perfectly normal four chamber view. You don't see a ventricular septal defect. You see what looks like a primum septum and you pass this as normal. In other views, we queried the differential insertion. So the tricuspid and mitral valve, as we thought, are on the same level. But when you look at this in short axis, this is the same fetus, as I showed you with apparently normal view. There is not a normal mitral valve. There's the anatomy of an AVSD. So this is an example where there is an AVSD with no ventricular or atrial shunts. Now, thankfully, this baby had already been diagnosed with trisomy 21. As I, otherwise, I don't think I would have spotted this. But it's a really important trap to, to not look at the short axis of the AV valves in cases of doubt. And a further case of doubt, which can confuse with, it, with, an a, with an AVSD, is this. It's where you have this view where it looks like you've got the normal crux of the heart, and you see this circular structure here. Now, this is an enlarged coronary sinus, and this, this actual primal septum and atrial septum looks normal. 
But as you scan downwards below the mitral valve, and really important to see that you don't see the mitral valve opening, to below the mitral valve, you see an enlarged coronary sinus, for which the usual explanation is that there is a persisting left SVC draining through the coronary sinus, and sometimes only a single left SVC draining through the coronary sinus. So watch out for that and do sweep through your views to see whether you can find the coronary sinus and if possible, get a short axis view of the AV valves to show that this is not an AVSD and is truly a mitral valve, but simply an enlarged coronary sinus. I know I'm moving around a lot, but next I'm going to look at pulmonary venous drainage. And I really want you to focus on looking here at the normal pulmonary venous drainage. You see veins from the left and the right draining to the left atrium. And really importantly, you can see that the left atrium is right up against the descending aorta. There's no real space there. And if you dot for this, you'll see the normal phasic flow pattern of the pulmonary veins. So what about this example? On first glance, you might say this looks normal, but have a very close look at the back of the atrium here. And this is a slightly unusual appearance here at the back. It's a, you've got a sort of looks like there might be a, sec, a further chamber behind the atrial mass. And this is where I think really the combination of color and cross-sectional imaging comes into its own. Whereas this is the same case, we see the left atrium, and here we see the pulmonary veins not joining the left atrium, but coming to a confluence, which we see here, and is shown in the stills to the right. These, left, these veins come close to, but not draining into the left atrium. And this is really important to check that you don't just see color, but you really do see these veins draining into the left atrium. And you should Doppler them because sometimes with anomalous veins, you'll see that phasic pattern lost, particularly if the veins are obstructed. I don't have time to go into every single feature, but note when you come up in this example, same example, we see the pulmonary artery, the transverse aortic arc, and the, the SVC is now bigger than both the, a, than the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And in this example, it's bigger because the pulmonary veins are draining above the heart in super, in super cardiac, total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. And this is a good clue to that diagnosis. We now get, again, with the reconstructions, just to explain the anatomy, you see the confluence behind the heart. In this case, an ascending vein going up and then draining into the superior vena cava. So these type of reconstructions, they complement echo, they don't substitute for uh, echo. So what we've learned here is really, um, coarctation of the aorta remains a big challenge. Measurements can help stratify risk, but we've still got challenges there. In order to understand the three best and secure variations, you need to have a clear understanding of the normal appearances and the right aortic arch can have implications for particularly trache tracheal compression and associated genetic abnormalities. If you see equal size atrium and ventricles, it doesn't mean that all is well. You need to look carefully at the morphology of the ventricles, look at the crux of the heart very carefully. If you're in doubt at AV with AV valves, short axis views can sometimes help. Pulmonary veins are difficult even in expert hands, and you should really do your best to ensure that they truly drain into the left atrium and not close to it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, John. Beautiful image uh, touching on topics which are very important. We are now getting quite a few questions from the audience, which is wonderful, but I'm going to restrict one after your talk, and then uh, we will have more time for questions and answers afterwards that will address uh, everyone. Uh, and the question uh, that has come up here, which is more pertinent to your talk, is where is the best place to measure the aorta for diagnosis of coarctation? <laughs> Well, we, we would measure it if you can get the V, which I explained. I hope you can hear me all right. I've got some comments about sound. Are you hearing me okay? If you're, it, what we would do is measure in that V shape, 
we would measure just before the two arteries meet. So we measure more or less the most distal point that we can see in that three vessel trachea view just before the V's meet. Um, people argue about what that exactly represents. And in truth, we don't, it, it is a view which is, we can't exactly know where we are in relation to the head and neck vessels in that view, but that's what we do. And we'd measure it just proximal to where those V's meet, where we can see the full extent of the aorta and we measure the duct in the similar position if we can get that neat view with them both in the same, in the same cup. Sometimes you can't, and sometimes you need to measure them a little bit separately, but ideally in that V before, just before the V's meet. Thank you very much. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna introduce our third uh, speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure again to introduce Jade Cruz, who um, is a colleague of mine from our same country. Jada is a consultant in fetal medicine with uh, over 12 years experience. He has a great interest in the fetal heart. He is the coordinator of the first trimester clinic at Centro Universitario Hospitalar Lisboa, Central. Uh, as I said, very great special interest in the fetal heart, particularly in the first trimester. And that's the topic today. He's gonna to concentrate on first trimester cardiac assessment. How far can we see? Okay, so let's talk about the first trimester heart, how far can we see? And for the sake of time, I'm going to actually focus on the normal, the normal views mainly. Uh, we all know why is it important. We've been discussing about fetal abnormality and everything. This is data <coughs> that uh, most of you know, it's from the EuroCAD that shows us uh, that um, cardiac defects are the most common congenital abnormalities, even when you exclude uh, genetic and chromosomal abnormalities. And uh, despite of being one of the, uh, the most common congenital abnormalities, the detection, uh, the prenatal detection of cardiac defects are among the, the least detected, the less detected. Uh, if you compare, for example, transposition of great arteries with uh, some other uh, major structural defects in different systems, you see that it, uh, it is one of the less detected. Although we have increased the detection rate over the years, it is still one of the least detected. So it is important uh, efforts like this so we can improve our detection rate of cardiac abnormality. And this is in any uh, gestation in any gestational age. And when we include uh, the smallness of the heart in the first trimester, we all know that the challenges in assessing the heart uh, increases. Heart is challenging at any gestation because it's a complex anatomic structure that keep on moving all the time in a fetus that moves all the time. This is not only a challenge for us that see, but it's also a challenge for the, for the, 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 the ultrasound systems to produce uh, quality image so we can properly uh, assess that. And in the first trimester, we increase these this difficulties and these challenges because we have a much smaller uh, structure to evaluate. But we know that it is possible to, to, to assess the heart, that it is possible to detect um, structural abnormalities in the first trimester. This is data from a paper published early this year from the group of Professor Kipris Nicolaidis, where it shows that about uh, half of the major cardiac defects are, uh, were detected in the first trimester. And when we move to different, um, different type of cardiac, major cardiac defects, we see that the, um, the, the detection rate in the first trimester varies a lot from 92% for hypoplastic left heart syndrome to a third of the tetralogy of a low detectant in the first trimester, and only about 13% of the transposition of great arteries detected in the first trimester. There are many explanations for this difference, uh, but one that one, one, I like to, to think on a, uh, to suppose actually that one of the, 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 the contrib one of the things that contribute to this difference is that actually, uh, if you look at the rest of the data that I didn't brought up here, uh, most of the major cardiac defects that you can see in the first trimester are actually detected, that you can see in the four chambers view 
are actually detected in the first trimester. So mainly because we are very used to, to look at the four chambers in the first trimester and then we know the anatomy uh, because we do, most of us, we perform tricuspid regurgitation assessment as a marker for trisomy 21. And we are used to this, to this image and therefore we, ass we assess this, this uh, view more often and, and, and therefore we can uh, more easily uh, detect the cardiac abnormalities that are more visible in this session. While if you move to the, to the outflow tracts and the three vessel view in the first trimester is less common to the uh, sonographer, to the doctor, to the operator to move uh, with the same amount of confidence to, this, um, to, to these other views. And therefore, uh, the, the, there may be more difficult to assess uh, different um, uh, cardiac abnormalities that, that need uh, a more complete, complete assessment of the fetal heart. But so this is just to, to sort of illustrate that we can actually, we should actually look at the heart in the first trimester in a more whole way, sort of the same way that we look at in the, in the second or in the third trimester. This is uh, what we do in my unit here in every first trimester um, scan. People that come from the uh, that come to our unit to have a first trimester assessment of uh, trisomy 21 uh, risk, we look at the anatomy and and as part of the anatomic assessment, we look at different parts of the heart in a similar fashion as we would do in the second trimester. So we look at the four chamber view, look at the size, position, proportion of the ventricles offsetting of the AV valves and look at the intact cracks. Um, left outflow tract, we look at the clear connection uh, with the aorta to the left ventricle and the septal integrity and the crossover of the great arteries. Of course, when we move to the uh, crossover the, of the great arteries. Right outflow tract, we, we look at the clear connection and branching of the uh, pulmonary artery and of course assessment of the crossover of the arteries. Um, and then we move to the three vessel view. We look at the clear visualization of the, the vessels, the V sign and the balanced vessel. So we try to look at all of this, all of these markers, all of these anatomic structures in the first trimester. And uh, in, a in an ongoing study that we're going to show you some data that we have, we have now analyzed more than nine, nearly a thousand patients in an unselected routine first trimester scan. And uh, we look at how often we are able to see the structure I just pointed out for you in the first trimester uh, in, in, in an examination. So we look at the four chambers and in about 80% of the time, we were managed to see using B mode and color Doppler, we, we were managed to see the four chamber view adequately uh, with all the, 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 all the, the, the points I pointed out before. The same goes through the aorta. We managed to see about 70% of the time the, the aorta, the left outflow tract, with uh, taking into account the points I just mentioned. Uh, pulmonary artery, we managed to see about 65% of the pulmonary arteries. And the three vessel view, we managed to adequately see in about 88% of the time. Um, <clears throat> we know that detection of abnormalities depend on correct assessment of, of the structures and the heart is not different. And to correctly assess the structure uh, in ultrasound, we always depend on the expertise of whoever is looking at the heart, the time you allocated for the scan. We know that nowadays we have a lot of pressure to perform a lot of scans from uh, many different people. Um, but we know that we need adequate time to properly assess uh, the fetal heart and all the other structures. Depending on the objectives you have for scan, of, uh, for the scan, as I told you, the, the objectives we have there take a little bit more time. And the part that I'm going to show you a little bit, the new technology that may help you to assess uh, better the heart. And of course, markers for abnormalities that can help you to think of the abnormalities, but this is not the point. 
uh, here today. You can use NUCO translucency to, to, to better select the, the patient with a higher risk for cardiac abnormalities, but this is not what we are going to talk today. Um, in technology that helps, we came across uh, a, a different Doppler, not a different Doppler signal. It, the signal is the same as any other Doppler, but the algorithm that reads the Doppler a little bit different. In a normal Doppler uh, evaluation, when you have, in order for you to have the, the image of the Doppler, this is a very basic uh, interpretation of actually, of what actually is SMI. But I think it may just make it sort of clear how does it work. So in order for you to have the signal Doppler, everything that is not signal Doppler, and here I'm calling noise, uh, it's eliminated. And when you eliminated it, you also eliminate part of the Doppler uh, that are less intense, the microvasculature, the, uh, that. so you remove that together with the noise. So a regular Doppler, however high definition it has, it removes that. SMI sort of uh, sort that out a little better and remove the noise, leave you with the signal Doppler, including the less in intense, the microvascular, uh, and also, does a better job in, in detecting motion rather than flow and, and also removing that. So you, are, you end up with a much uh, precise sort of um, um, image from the Doppler. And the great, what you have is this kind of image. Uh, you have two ways. This one is the one I like more. It works as a subtraction mode where you, it takes a while for you to adapt your, your your eyes to that, it sort of works as an inversion mode. And I, although you are looking at Doppler here, um, it actually helps you to assess the structure. Because of the subtraction, helps you to see the structure very well. So what we are looking here is a first trimester cardiac scan, is a sweep from the four chamber view to the three vessel view, where you can clearly see a uh, lot of things here, like for example, you can clearly see the filling of the ventricles, the proportion of both ventricles. Uh, I think the frame rate here, uh, I don't know if the frame rate is very good for you, but you can see the outflow tract and the clear connection here with the left ventricle. You can see pulmonary artery, you can see the crossing. Um, we can see very clearly the pulmonary artery and the, and the branching of the pulmonary artery. And you can see the trivesse here. So it looks great. Um, it looks like it can help us to improve and can see better the heart, but can does, can it, does it really work? And this is the results from a paper published from uh, Dr. Uh, Z, uh, Dr. Vita Zideri and, and Professor John uh, Simpson group, um, where we analyze um, about 167 cardiac scan, high risk population. This is a retrospective study. study. Uh, within that, we're looking at the 55 normal hearts. And the, 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 the data they get is that the SMI uh, overall seems to increase the overall rate of visualization of the different structure, four chamber, outflow tract, and three vessel trachea view. Although uh, the intra and inter observer variation um, comparing SMI with the B mode and color Doppler with SMI is a little bit uh, higher, which can be explained by several different things. But the, the, the important point here is that in this, in this study, SMI show, shows some, some good perspective as a, 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 a additional tool in evaluating fetal heart and seeing the fetal uh, cardiac structures in the first trimester. This is unpublished data from the same study I, I, I already told you at the beginning. Uh, we look at the same structures with SMI. So we compare the B mode uh, plus color, the, the visualization of the correct anatomic structures that we, using B mode and uh, color Doppler with B mode color Doppler plus SMI in an unselected routine first trimester scan. So this was patients coming up, coming up for the 11, 13 week scan where we analyzed the, the heart. And the, and, the, and, the, and the assessment were performed by 
uh, phenomedicine specialist. So we saw an, in, uh, an improvement in the visualization of the, the cardiac structures in the first trimester. All the image you have here on the top, they are all for, for, from first trimester uh, image, 11 to 13 weeks uh, images. And from the visualization of the four chamber view increased from 80 to 99%. The aorta, clear visualization of the aorta from 70 to 94% from pulmonary artery from 65 to 98%, and the three vessel view from 88 to 98%. Uh, this is, all, of course, unpublished data yet. Hopefully, it will be soon uh, sent to publication. But it shows that, apparently, it increases the visualization of the, uh, the, the cardiac structure, the normal cardiac structure. It also helps you to see a little bit more in difficult situations. We, we, we measure the distance from the probe to the heart when we are assessing the, the, the cardiac structures. And what we see, although it's, uh, uh, it's not highly significant, there is a significant difference in the use of SMI. SMI, the average uh, distance where you could see the structures using B mode and color Doppler were 70 millimeters, while when you're using SMI, you add up SMI, this distance increased to 8.6 centimeters or 86 centimeters. So SMI probably helps you to see the structure easier or better, and also helps you or to see a little bit more uh, in more difficult situations. The, 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 the question that could rise is, does it help you to see car the cardiac defects? And it's difficult to talk about the, 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 how, how a tool is good to detect a cardiac defect, but, and we don't still have the study for that. Uh, but I just want to leave with an example of a recent case that we have, a patient that was referred because of a cardiac normality. It was referred as a hypoplastic right heart. And you could see here that you don't really see flow in the, heart, in the right heart. You only see on the left side and you see only one vessel coming out here uh, from, this, from this ventricle. And that's all the, the, the most of the information you could get. And when you add the SMI, this is the same patient, the same day, this is the SMI. And this is the, the, the still image here that makes easier the point. Uh, it just gives you a little bit more of the information. Uh, you can see here that you have an uh, interventricular septal defect. You can see that there is still a uh, right ventricle here that fills up a little bit, and you don't see two um, AV valves. So you have a little bit more information that you have here. You cannot say that it's going to help you to detect more cardiac abnormalities, but it seems that it may help you to, to better define which kind of abnormality we're going to be looking at. And thank you all for, for your time. Thank you very much, Jada. This is a wonderful presentation on first trimester fetal heart. Um, I think I, I'm gonna join up a few questions, which is, uh, seems to be uh, of great interest, which is about which, um, uh, which uh, mode you do, transvaginal or transabdominally. And there are, there are a few questions, basically, um, are you scans transabdominal, transvaginal? Why don't you use transvaginal, i.e. the whole time? And uh, how often do you use transvaginal scan if you're scanning the fetal heart uh, in the first trimester? In, the, in this population, I, uh, I show the, the numbers there, 98% uh, of the time we use transabdominal scan. We only use transvaginal in the, the, and it was nearly 2%. Uh, most of them we perform transabdominally. Um, we only move to transvaginal when it's, we cannot see. We have multiple fibroids or you have uh, uh, very obese patients, so you don't have uh, a, clear, a clear assessment of the fetal heart. And uh, that's just because it seems weird. We've, it's, we're not against transvaginal, of course, uh, evaluation of the heart. We just feel that it's easier because you have much more freedom in moving your hand one side to the other, especially when the baby is not in a, a very good position. And in most of the time, we manage to have a, a clear view of everything that we need to do. 
I would concur with, with that. And I, all my first trimesters come one, I'm not an obstetrician and I personally don't do transvaginal if I need it, which is less than 2% of the cases. I think we get the information, but I normally scan around 13 weeks if I'm doing first trimester. Uh, I think before that, maybe there is a bit more of a row of transvaginal. So another question for you, if I may, uh, Jade, is about uh, the value of tricuspid regurgitation in the first trimester as a kind of a marker for trisomy 21. Uh, what's your views on that? For trisomy 21? Yeah, tricuspid regurgitation on the first trimester scan. Well, you, we, we so far have uh, um, a screening system uh, was developed by many, many studies by, by the group of Professor Nicolaitis and, and now we have all available online at the Fetal Medicine Foundation where we take in consideration uh, markers like nuclear translucency, nasal bone, ductus venosus flow and tricuspid regurgitation. It is also a marker for trisomy 21 as well as a marker for cardiac abnormalities if I may include. Yes, I think I might just add something from the cardiological perspective. Uh, the tricuspid regurgitation, if you don't get good image of the fetal heart, they're just doing a screening. It is something to tell you, look more closely at the heart, because sometimes that is not really a tricuspid regurgitation. Underneath that, there may be an atrioventricular septal defect, for example. So I think it's a very first crude step, because there is so much tricuspid regurgitation, short duration when you do post-wave Doppler in the first trimester, which just resolves as the pregnancy goes on, which to me, uh, without looking closer to the fetal heart, we just need to be a bit cautious uh, not to overestimate the value of that. It is, of course, a value, and it's important to look at, for cardiac abnormalities, for example, to look then at your pulmonary outflow tract, because the tricuspid regurgitation could be a marker for important pulmonary stenosis. So, Use, I would use it as a general marker, and this is a sign to say, let's have a closer look at the structure of the heart in case there is a, an underlying heart abnormality that may be a marker for trisomy 21 or for cardiac abnormalities. So, Thank you again for a wonderful presentation. There are lots of questions coming up now, and I think we can join everyone, and I try and uh, keep track now of what's coming on. Um, there are quite a few questions that are related to pulmonary uh, stenosis. So obviously, uh, it is a, a lesion that can be easily missed antenatally, if you, particularly if you don't use color, uh, and if the heart looks nearly normal at uh, uh, 20 weeks. So one of the questions is, can pulmonary stenosis be diagnosed, diagnosed on the three-vessel view? So that's open to the panel. Uh, maybe everyone wants to answer. Um. Did I pick that up first? Um, I think it, 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 unfortunately, my answer to that is it depends. If we take the grayscale view, the black and white view, with pulmonary stenosis, the size of the pulmonary artery is highly variable. So if the pulmonary artery may be small, uh, where you've got severe obstruction. Sometimes, actually, the pulmonary artery, beyond the valve, the pulmonary artery can appear prominent if you get some post-stenotic dilatation. So I don't think on grade scale there's a very reliable way of picking this out. If you are looking fully, you should use color flow Doppler to see aliasing of flow across the pulmonary valve, supplemented by measuring the velocity. And in addition, you may get a clue by looking at whether there is anti-grade or retrograde flow in the duct, because if there is severe pulmonary valve stenosis, you will begin to see retrograde flow in the duct. But the size actually of the valve and the pulmonary arteries is quite, is quite variable. So there's not a cutoff you can use to detect that lesion simply on that view. Any other views on the subject of pulmonary stenosis on this vessel view? But that will lead me to another question is, do you measure the pulmonary artery and the aorta on the three vessel view as a kind of routine mes me measurement for anyone in the panel? Uh, I, I don't do it. I just, I just look at them by uh, eyeballing and measuring I do uh, at the valve level. But if you are uncertain, uh, you could do it. Uh, but if you have a lot of experience, 
I, I don't think you should measure it in the three fossil fuel. So I'll be controversial and say we do. A part of our policy is when they come to us, we will measure the three vessel view, we'll measure the, at least the size of the distal aortic arch, um, just to document that that is uh, within, normal, within normal limits. Uh, it's not so difficult. The machines have got the Z scores already built in. So as you, as you make the measurements, it'll come up and tell you whether the measure is average or whether this is bigger or smaller than it should be. But at a minimum, we would do the distal aortic arch and very often the duct in the same view. So we've got the comparison of the, say, of the two. I do agree with Monique that if it looks plumb normal, it really does look normal in experienced hands. Is there a, a huge additional value from making that measurement? Well, you could question that, but we, we, do, we do it as part of our routine. I'm just gonna be controversial here because there are two different views and the question specifically was, on the three vessel view, which I think the answer is probably no, because there are no normal data for the three vessel view. I think your answer goes a little bit beyond, which is the three vessel trachea view, which you already discussed in your talk. So right. I think of that is right. of value, particularly if you think of coactation. But I agree with Monique as well that, you know, if you experience, you kind of know, like you look at everything in the baby and you don't measure necessarily everything. but there's nothing to stop anyone. If you want to get confidence that you know how to assess, start making some measurements, you get a feel for the measure, and then you start concentrating on that. And then you get the experience to see just by eyeballing, are they more or less the same size? Is the pulmonary artery just a little bit bigger? And if you're in doubt if it's very big, there are Z scores for the pul main pulmonary artery. So you can see if that falls within the normal range or not. But I personally don't measure it routinely, only if the pulmonary artery looks looks uh, dilated usually, not too small, dilated. Now, I'm same. gonna keep, uh, oh, yes, please. No, no, it's just, it's the same. I mean, I agree with you and uh, Monique, so we, we, do, we don't do as per routine, only when uh, you have uh, some questions that we are not sure about the, the discrepancy between them. But I'm going to stick to the pulmonary stenosis. As I said, I was a bit interested in that. Uh, sibling with pulmonary stenosis, if you are scanning a lady that you know, had a previous baby with pulmonary stenosis, what else do you offer additional scans for that pregnancy? And if so, uh, what's the kind of policy? I do. Uh, I do. I will offer an additional scan at, let's say, uh, 32 weeks. I do as well, around 32, 34 weeks, John. We do as well. It's, we're, we're in agreement, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> we are all in agreement with that. <laughs> yeah, no, no controversy there. I think, you know, not just for aortic history of pulmonary stenosis, but history of uh, aortic stenosis and coactation in our policy is to do a late scan. Usually it's just for reassurance of the family because if you don't see really in detail, you can match. But pulmonary stenosis is a bit tricky. Sometimes, you know, uh, you do come across something that manifests a little bit later more than the aortic stenosis, I think. So no, no uh, questions on that. Can, can, I, can I just add one thing? I'm actually going to ask Monique one thing. Uh, do you, because we are, I mean, myself and Monique, we are phytomedicine specialists and you and John are cardiologists. So when you say that you offer an extra scan, means that you are offering an extra fetal echocardiology scan. Yes. And we, yes. when we yes. say that we are offering another scan, means that we are offering, um, it, it, people can understand that we are simply offering a third trimester scan. So we are talking about offering a, a fetal echocardiography scan, isn't it? Yes. yes. Correct, because, and I think you now some of these cases, the previous history might have been a postnatal diagnosis uh, of pulmonary, critical pulmonary stenosis, for example, that was missed at 20 weeks. So I think it's more for uh, anxiety of the family, so they know that, you know, nothing's going to develop during the pregnancy. So uh, most of the time it is a reassuring, but it is a fetal echo where you remeasure the velocities across the pulmonary valve or the aortic valve or reassess the coactation, if that's the case. A population that is that is specific at risk for pulmonary stenosis are uh, TTTS, 
uh, fetuses that were treated for um, uh, monochorionic twins that were treated for TDTS. And then you can then you can see the development of pulmonary stenosis even uh, much later in pregnancy. Correct. Now there is uh, one specific question for uh, Monique. It's about the uh, if I understood the question correctly about the angle of the septum and the left ventricular outflow tract in tetralogy of fallow. Uh, if you think that that angulation is in any way a sign of tetralogy of fallow. Yeah, I, I think what they mean is uh, the cardiac axis, and that is true. In a lot of uh, fallow cases, the cardiac axis, so the angle between the ventricular septum and the midline of the chest, uh, is enlarged. Um, so that is a good remark of the audience. Uh, that, is, that is a way to trigger you to the diagnosis of fallow. Or any other, if it is a cardiac axis they were referring to, it is for conotronchal abnormality and it's quite yeah. typically that the trial of could be coarctation as well. So uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, a specific question for John about a linear attachment of the AV valves uh, in, in VSC, but I guess it's saying in atrioventricular septal defect. By linear, normally we expect that the the mitral and tricuspid valves are inserted at slightly different level. And when you see a linear attachment, it means the mitral and tricuspid valves are inserted at exactly the same level. Now in an AVSD, there will be bridging leaflets, so there will be no differential insertion of the valve, which can also give a linear type appearance. Um, just because the attachment is linear, so there's no different insertion, doesn't make it an ABSD. And that's why I said that in addition to associated defects, if you can get views of the short axis of the valves, that's sometimes challenging, that can help to work out the morphology of the valve. But that's what I mean by linear attachment. It's quite frequently seen in babies with trisomy 21, even without associated actual abnormalities that, the, that there's not a proper differential insertion of the AV, AV valve. And also in conotronchal uh, defects, the differential insertion is less than in normal uh, hearts. That's correct. There's a lot of work from the French group uh, looking at even without an atrial ventricular septal defect, just having a linear attachment, uh, it's very difficult to see the offset in conotron, particularly transposition, uh, and also as a marker for chromosome abnormality, even if you don't have sort of slightly dysplastic valves with the valves more or less at the same level. Um, I think we may have a minute or two to uh, try and browse through a couple of questions. Uh, the best way to find a septal defect to look for it. <laughs> Great. Yes. I, I think it's really uh, dependent on the on the insonation angle. So you should use different insonation angles for your four chamber view and use color doppler. That's, that would be my advice. And not to stay only in the four chamber view, but make a sweep through the whole heart because you have to realize that the four chamber view is only um, uh, one or two millimeters in uh, of the total uh, septum that you are examining at that time. So move your probe, use color Doppler, and have correct settings of your color Doppler. You should lower the PRF a bit. Yeah, seeing the PRF, uh, you know, particularly if you're looking at the eight proportion. Uh, and if from the four chamber, you should do a sweep from the back of the heart very slowly until the level of the four chamber, and then moving on to the outflow tract. And the PRF lower if you are looking more at the apical portion, the muscular portion. And when you come into the perimembranous areas, maybe increase your PRF because the velocity starts to increase in the, across the left ventricular outflow tract. So a little bit of adjustment of color. But I think the clue is to not to stick to just one image, is to do a sweep for the whole septum because otherwise you're going to miss. Uh, a ventricular septal defect, both outlets and, and, and posterior defects as well. Um, we, we, are, we agree again. 
I agree, yeah. Good. Um, there was another question about, do you advise against assessing the heart if the baby is on their, babies on their side or prone? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. You have to take what you get and uh, you need to learn to work around the uh, baby. There are actually some things, for example, left ventricular outflow tract, you can see very nicely when the baby is spine up. So it's not true that all views are bad if the baby is spine up. And I think you have to uh, really, you know, move your probe a lot to try and get different angles of insonation. Um, and occasionally, obviously, we need to try and get the baby, the, 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 uh, the baby to move if we can. I guess we used to ask mothers to cough, but we don't do that anymore. Um, and uh, certainly not in COVID times. And um, we, you know, it, but it's not true that you can't assess the baby in a particular uh, lie. You have to work with the way the baby's lying and you adjust to the way the baby is, um, is lying. There may be some areas that you simply can't see with babies who are particularly awkward. And my only tip for that is, is the golden rule is don't report what you can't see. If you can't see, you just can't see. Uh, don't get lured into reporting something to complete the scan if you just can't see it. Uh, I think if I may, one more question, that's probably for you, John, about what, what's meant by an unbalanced AVSD. An unbalanced AVSD in the simplest sense is that where the size of the ventricles appears to be markedly unequal. So um, where either the left ventricle is small and the, or the right ventricle is small. And the implication is that normally we would look for an atrioventricular septal defect to repair the ventricular and atrial components and the valve that we would be septating the heart back to the two sides of the heart, so to a normal two ventricle circulation. If an ABSD is severely unbalanced, that may be impossible. So it may impact on what you say about the longer term prognosis. And equally, so for example, if you see right ventricle dominance in a small left ventricle, if you have normally connected great arteries, then you, you really need to look for associated lesions like um, uh, coarctation, for example, in the case of a small left ventricle. Or if there's evidence of heterotaxy, which fre frequently coexists with unbalanced ABSDs, then you need to look for all the malformations which be associated with isomerism or heterotaxy uh, as part of the complete picture. Yeah, it can be quite complicated, the unbalanced ABSDs, isn't it? So I think we actually, we probably, you know, answer quite a lot of the questions. Uh, and some of them have been answered directly. I'd like to uh, thank you, all the um, speakers. Thank you, Canon, again for organizing these. And I hope the uh, participants, I'm sure the participants would have taken a, a lot of information from uh, this uh, very good session. Thank you very much again.